This is the constellation and we can vaguely make out the, the water bearer. And next we have a, a slide of a, an artistic depiction of this, this constellation. I think it's from the 16th century. And we can see the man, some depictions show a woman, um, pouring a, a jug of water. Now, if we look at this constellation as seen from the southern hemisphere, and again, this is one of uh, Christopher Picking's photographs, we can see that the water would have to be flowing uphill to resemble a water bearer. So, like Libra, I don't think that people in the Southern Hemisphere would have associated this sign, this constellation, with the season of when Aqu Aquarius takes place in, in the North. There's a, there's a mismatch there. Now, there are some other solutions to the problem, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the video, of how to solve the uh, reverse seasons problem. And one of those that I want to mention is by an Australian astrologer by the name of Caroline Tully. And she has a website called uh, Earth Song, which, uh, again, I will put up the link below the video and she gives this solution and I quote if Australians had created astrology firstly we would have viewed the signs along the ecliptic upside down and we would have seen them we, sorry we would not have seen them as a ram a bull and so on but perhaps as a kangaroo or an emu a spotted couscous or a blue tongued lizard and secondly, we would have been seeing the, the, the same actual constellation as the Northern Hemisphere, but experienced it in the opposite season, and therefore named it something that related to the season it was experienced in. End of quote. We have a constellation as seen from the Southern Hemisphere here, and this is another work by uh, Christopher Picking, from New Zealand. So you can see the, the Kiwis, which is a, a fond term for people that live in New Zealand, they've actually connected the dots to form a Kiwi constellation, which kind of illustrates uh, Caroline Tully's theory, her point. Now to me this is certainly one solution to the problem, but the disadvantage is that we lose the traditional tropical zodiac symbolism as it evolved in the northern hemisphere and all the mythological and occult association and religious associations like Christmas and Easter that go with it. Okay, there's another solution by another Australian astrologer uh, named Craig McIntosh and he suggested that we should adapt the meaning of the signs to the Southern Hemisphere without actually changing the familiar names or position of those signs. So that in autumn in Australia, which is the, that's when the sign of Gemini occurs, um, I quote, so Gemini would be a time to be given over to mental pursuits and the development of ideas as we move inside end of quote, or the spring in Australia, sign of Scorpio, becomes, and I quote, the intense energy of the bud bursting forth with the sexuality of, of spring, end of quote. But to me, as it means that astrology books written in Australia would not be relevant for Northern Hemisphere countries. Okay, so that's why I think it's more elegant to go with this adaptation of Dane Rajya's 
ideas and that's to have six dual or double tropical signs instead of 12 signs and hopefully you can all see this colored diagram that I have drawn here it's not a very exact diagram I did it by hand did it with Windows Paint I think and you can see that I've made the 12 signs that we know into six pairs. So the first pair would be Aries, Libra. Second pair would be Taurus, Scorpio. Then Gemini, Sagittarius. And then Cancer, Capricorn. And then Leo, Aquarius. And Virgo, Pisces. So that we have six double signs or, or six dual signs. Now I've used the uh, 12 tone col color scale that um, I don't know if anybody has studied the, the Western mysteries, but in that system they use these colors which are, they also correspond to the 12 semitones of the Western musical scale. So we have Aries red, Taurus red orange, Gemini orange, Cancer orange yellow, Leo yellow, Virgo yellow green, uh, Libra green, Scorpio blue green, sometimes teal, uh, Sagittarius blue, Capricorn blue violet, Aquarius violet, and Pisces violet red, sometimes known as magenta, I believe. Um, and another way we can look at these dual signs is by calling them rather ingenious names. I remember there was an article in American Astrology magazine, back which is now called Horoscope Guide, in the 90s. Um, I, I think it's still written by an author by the name of Tim Lyons. I think he's still writing for it. But uh, And I don't know if he made these up, these names up, or whether he was just quoting from another 20th century astrologer by the name of uh, Mark Edmund Jones. Um, but anyway, his, his rather cute names for these signs were um, Ariba for Aries Libra, Torio for Taurus Scorpio, um, Sajimi for Gemini Sagittarius, uh, Cancercorn for Cancer Capricorn, Aquilo for Leo Aquarius and Vices or sometimes Pergo for Virgo Pisces. Okay, so that's the, the six dual signs. So a person born in April, for example, would be born under Aries Libra or Ariba, but would be more weighted towards Aries in the Northern Hemisphere and Libra in the Southern Hemisphere as shown by that diagram. Someone born in August would be a Leo Aquarius or an Aquilo. If they were born in London, they would ha have more weight towards Leo, and if born in South Africa, they would be more weighted towards Aquarius. A person born on the equator on the same day would have equal weighting of Leo and Aquarius. So let's just look at this idea of polarity in astrology. All right, it's a, it's a very strong theme. For example, we cannot really understand the sense of selfhood and identity of Aries without considering the idea of other, the other person, represented by Libra. We, we just can't do it because as soon as we start thinking of ourselves as, as separate, you know, me, I, I am, we have to think, well, separate from what? And that's the rest of the world. That's the other. So they... They really go together. We'd also find it difficult to describe plant or animal growth represented by Taurus without considering the food and fertilizer provided by dead organisms represented by Scorpio. And anybody who likes gardening will know that. You know, we, we get strong plants by giving them a lot of fertilizer, natural uh, dead organisms from the, uh, the autumn the previous autumn. 
the discriminatory faculty of the human mind which enables thought and communication, sometimes known as the lower mind assigned to Gemini, is mirrored by the concept-gathering faculty, sometimes known as the higher mind assigned to Sagittarius. Then moving on to the the next uh, dual signs, the inner receptivity of moon-ruled water sign cancer provides nourishment, both physical and emotional, to those closest to us, like family. But food needs to be grown following the laws of agriculture, and it costs money. You know, somebody has to be paid. People, it has to be earned. So cancer is mirrored by its opposite sign, Capricorn whose focus is on the outer structure of the physical world. Then moving on to the the next signs, Leo and Aquarius, the royal son ruled Leo would be out of a job if he or she did not rule with social justice of Aquarius. And from a biological point of view, whereby the zodiac signs rule areas of anatomy, changes in our peripheral circulatory system ruled by Aquarius, such as hardening or buildup of plaque in our arteries, eventually affect the master pump, the heart, ruled by Leo. The precision analysis and meticulousness of Virgo, the the part of the next pair of signs, works hand in hand with the imaginative input from the Piscean subconscious mind. For example, a good poem which conjures up images and inspires us with hidden meaning would not exist without the thoughtful use of words that would be assigned to Virgo and a beautiful photograph or video that would be assigned to Pisces depends partly on the use of a a good camera lens and accurate focusing mechanism you know somebody that knows how to use a camera all technical abilities of Virgo so I hope we can see that both sides of these polarities are necessary from for an understanding of the complete cycle of life In this diagram, I've superimposed the sine wave diagram that we saw earlier on with the apparent path of the sun through the year on a double globe showing the the dual or double signs. Okay, and then in the next diagram, I've made a more accurate schematic diagram of this apparent path of the sun through the dual signs. So looking on the left here we can see the the first dual sign Aries, Libra or Ariba. You can see that somebody born in the second square down on the left, that would be in the northern hemisphere, maybe at a latitude like England, around about 50 north. They would be mostly Aries, but they'd still have that little bit of Libra in them. And then if we go down to, again, on the left, we we look at the, the fifth square down, or second from the bottom, we can see that somebody born in the southern hemisphere, maybe in South Africa, or maybe in Argentina, or maybe in New Zealand, they would be mostly Libra, but they'd have a little bit of Aries in them, okay? So that principle would work for all the, the dual signs for Taurus Scorpio, for Gemini. Sagittarius, for Cancer, Capricorn, etc. All right, that's the principle of the dual or six sign zodiac. Okay, so hopefully we've got all the the theory set out now. And the next thing that I'd like to, to do is just examine if there's any scientific evidence linking personality to season of birth and surprisingly enough there is there was some quite groundbreaking research a couple of years ago by a person named Dr. Douglas McMahon at Vanderbilt University and he's shown that biological clocks and okay this is in mice all right it it, it is experimenting on mice not humans 
but he found that the biological clocks were set at the time that they were born. Now, what McMahon did in his experiment with the mice was he simulated or tried to simulate seasons um, by manipulating the amount of light, trying to simulate uh, different days of daylight and, and night. Now, mice are actually relatively close to humans on the evolutionary scale, so it's not unreasonable that similar effects would be found in humans. And it, it has been demonstrated, and there are some experiments that uh, I'm going to try to uh, cite here, that individuals are more prone to certain diseases, for example, schizophrenia, if they're born in the winter or early spring, and this might be because their mothers lacked an essential nutrient while they were developing in the womb, or be due to the flu virus, more common in cold weather. And this scientific evidence is very similar to observations made by astrologers for thousands of years, who've known that, if, in it, that individuals born in the winter under the measuring device sign of Capricorn are often cautious, frugal, disciplined, and rather pessimistic compared to their summer-born fellow human beings. Do these traits reflect the harsh, cold conditions of many winter environments where parents have to work harder to nourish their children than in summer, when plant food is more available? A summer baby, for example, born during July in the Northern Hemisphere, would have more time devoted to him from his parents and more food, so therefore might develop more of what we know as a Cancerian, family-minded personality, with more time to devote to his inner emotional needs, rather than constantly defending him or herself from the harsh environment. Also, the science of epigenetics, and, and again, I'm going to put a, a link under the, the video, is showing us that early environment can actually change the gene makeup of an individual. Then we have to ask, well, what about other planets in the zodiac? What, besides the sun, how are they linked to a person's personality? And Finding a causal mechanism for how astrology works, if it does work, apart from the very basic beginnings of a theory of sun signs based on seasonal biology, is a current challenge for astrologers, let's just put it that way. What we would have to show is scientific evidence that the cycles of the planets in the solar system are directly or indirectly related to the biochemical processes which occur in the body, such as absorption of certain nutrients from food, which would in turn govern our brain and other organ structures and function, affecting a person's health and personality. We'd also have to cite evidence that planetary cycles correspond to established theories of human social development, such as those proposed by 20th century developmental psychologists such as Piaget. Well, it just so happens that one of those developmental psychologists by the name of Daniel Levinson, uh, he wrote a book called Seasons of a Man's Life, and he suggested that a person's life is divided into four periods. And I'm going to just run through this quite quickly because it, it is a bit complicated, so I'm just going to simplify this into these periods known as childhood and adolescence, 13 to 17, early adulthood, ages 20 to 22 to 40, middle adulthood, and late adulthood. Okay, and they're actually interspersed with transition periods. But what's important is that knowing the cycle of the planets, for example, Uranus has an 84-year-old-year cycle, and uh, Saturn has a 30-year cycle, Jupiter has a 12-year cycle. Knowing this, we can perhaps relate these cycles to the cycles discovered by psychologists. So, for example, Uranus square Uranus, which is a period 
quite well known to astrologers and, and it happens to uh, early 20s people um, I think it's 21 yes so it'd be a quarter of 84 yes 21 uh, that would that would correspond to the the period that I just quoted from Daniel Levinson um, I think it's early the beginning of early adulthood um, another cycle would be the Saturn cycle, 30-year cycle, um, or Jupiter square Jupiter. So what I'm trying to say is here we have the beginnings of some sort of empirical, but by social psychology standards anyway, evidence that astrology is related to human social development. Okay, now we have to consider, is there any astrological evidence that this sixth sign or dual zodiac works? And people might be asking, is there any astrological evidence that any astrology works? And that would be a fair question. So before we go ahead, let's just try and explain what we mean by astrological evidence. Now, as we know, astrology is not a science. I like to call it an art. I, this avoids the term pseudoscience, which is even worse. So let's just call it an art. And what we do with astrology is we try and find correlations. And a lot of it is just done internally, is just done intuitively. And one big criticism of this process is, well, it, it can be very biased, you know, it can just be our own opinions. So what happened in the last century was that a couple of psychologists tried to quantify the data. They tried to make astrology more scientific or at least as scientific as psychology was with the use of lots of data and statistics and the most famous person to do this was Michel Gogolin in in France and his wife Françoise. Um, you, you might have heard of the the Gogolin data um, there's been a lot of fighting over this for the past 50 years because there's been accusations of it being biased and nobody's really come to a definitive decision whether it was biased or not. It go, goes backwards and forwards between the, the skeptics and the astrologers. Um, but it, at least it was an attempt and uh, there, there will be more attempts in the future probably to try and find some acceptable correlation between the the planetary placements and and human behavior and by the way the Gogolan experiments were based on time of day diurnal placements rather than sun signs now another experiment that was done quite recently was actually by one of the skeptics who, who are quite vocal, um, and he is Michael Shermer of Caltech, uh, who runs the Skeptic Society there, and he publishes Skeptic magazine. Um, so about 10 years ago now, he, he did a, an experiment with uh, Vedic astrologer Jeffrey Armstrong, and this is on YouTube, you can Google it. And he tried to eliminate bias uh, with blinds and double blinds and he used all the protocols that modern psychologists use and he actually found favorable results for astrology. So I'm just mentioning those to show that astrology is being investigated um, quite methodically, you know, with these tools that we use in, in other fields. What I'm doing here is, of course, nothing like that. What sort of evidence I'm going to present is called anecdotal evidence.